Welcome to Better Relationships, Better Life, a podcast where you'll gain insights from relationship experts and entrepreneurial couples who have moved through conflict and into a better life. Crack the clarity code and create deeper connections beyond the messiness of relationships. Here's your host, Judy K. Herman. Welcome to this episode of Better Relationships, Better Life. You'll appreciate the conversation with best-selling author and speaker, Leslie Vernick, who confronts patriarchal views about the power control victim mentality in our marriages. Leslie's support and influence has been profound for me, both in my personal life and in my counseling career. She gives us clarity about destructive marriages, mental illness, and what every marriage needs in order to honor our human dignity and worth. So be ready for hope and insights. Let's take a listen. Welcome to Better Relationships, Better Life. My name is Judy Herman, and I have an amazing guest today, Leslie Vernick, who is a popular speaker and author and licensed social worker. I want to tell you also, Leslie, thank you so much, first of all, for being here, but you have been a staple in my counseling practice for many years. I have your books uh, beyond, or your books that uh, the emotionally destructive marriage and the emotionally destructive relationship have been very profound for me as a therapist and have helped my my clients so much but also I just I gotta bring attention to this one because this is huge (laughs) and working with couples how to act right when your spouse acts wrong I just love the title of that Mm -hmm. but I love it that you are a writer and a speaker and you have so many things that you're offering I mean transformation for women especially that are in very difficult or even destructive marriages thanks for being here you're so welcome thanks for inviting me Well, my pleasure. So I want to get to know you and your journey. So can you tell us more about who Leslie is? Oh, wow. Well, I've been married to the same good man for 46 years. Our anniversary was just this week and we were busy doing entrepreneurial things and doing a webinar and all those kind of things. So at the end of the day, we had a little glass of wine and said, okay, happy anniversary. <laughs> that was oh, it. But, uh, happy anniversary though yeah. to you. 46 years, that's a long time. What I has know. been your secret mm-hmm. uh, to be married to the same? And you're calling him a good man still. <laughs> Yes. And, and you've raised how many children? We've raised two children. We have three grandchildren and one dog, the third dog we've had together. But uh, yeah, so it's been, a, it's been a journey. And, you know, he is a good man, but he's not a perfect man. And I'm not a perfect woman. And we've had our uh, issues through the years and nothing that we haven't been able to work through, partly, Judy, because I think both of us have been willing to listen and both of us been willing to repent. And I think, you know, you need you need two things to make a marriage work. One is you need the awareness that it requires maintenance. You know, if you have a brand new house and you never maintain it, if you never clean the counters or wash the dishes or flush the toilet or take out the garbage, if you don't do maintenance, it doesn't take long for that house to start feeling pretty awful to live in. And then a house requires repairs. And so if it the toilet breaks down or there's termites, you've got to attend to them. And I think any long-term relationship needs maintenance and it needs repairs. And I think sometimes as counselors, we haven't discerned the difference. We've tried to do maintenance on something that needs repairs, like when a marriage really breaks down and trust breaks down and it's broken and we're trying to say, have a date night or bring her flowers or win her heart. That doesn't rebuild broken trust, honesty, Mm. transparency, repeated uh, repentance and and over time that shows that those behaviors aren't repeated, that starts to rebuild broken trust. And so my husband and I have had our issues, but I think we've always been pretty good at the maintenance and repairs part. So I think that's what's helped our relationship last. I think that's beautiful. And a key word to me that I'm hearing from you, Leslie, is we both, we both. (laughs) Like it does take two people still to be married, doesn't it? And uh, yeah, so so speak to that. Well, I think that that's one of the places I think the church has really been uh, weak in talking about the relationship of marriage, because it's sort of like they talk about the covenant of marriage, but the covenant is a relationship. It's not just a legal agreement. And so sometimes they're asking, and I work primarily with Christian women, but women to lie and pretend and stay in a relationship uh, at the cost of their own truth and their own integrity, that, that the marriage relationship itself is dead. Trust has been broken. There is no safety. Proverbs 31, for example, says, 
he trusts her to do him good, not harm all the days of his life. And those are some of the elements of a long-term stable, loving, maybe not all kinds of fireworks romance at that age, but, but the long-term relationship. And if you don't have that trust and safety, um, you can stay legally married to someone, but you can also live in a concentration camp in a prison with your enemies and it still does you harm. It's not a good relationship. Have you, I, I so admire you, Leslie, because on several levels, you are willing to speak out to pastors, to the church and the system and, and even our culture and how I, I really speaking out against the patriarchal uh, point of view. And what has that been like for you? I, I'm curious about your journey with that. You know, it's interesting, Judy, when I was writing my book on depression, which was my third book, it was the book I wrote after How to Act Right When Your Spouse Acts Wrong. So it was about 2003, 2004 that I wrote the depression book. And everybody in my practice at the time, you know, women who were coming to see me, um, I would say 95% of them were in destructive marriages and they were clinically wow. depressed. So I began to ask myself, well, wait a minute, if the relationship isn't repaired, because God tells us that relationships can be toxic to our spirits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if the relationship isn't repaired, if the relationship isn't safe, are we asking a Christian woman to live on antidepressants? And for some of them, other kinds of drugs or alcohol in order to be able to be sexually available to her husband, in order to be able to stay in an environment that's so toxic for her that she's wanting to kill herself. I remember going overseas as a missionary, uh, you know, just go to speak to help the missionaries. And I was a very safe person to talk to because I didn't live with them. I was going to go home. And I remember a missionary coming to me and she was so depressed and she said, I I'm going to kill myself. Mm. Um, and I, when I talked to her about why it was like, you know, my, my husband's so abusive. I can't live like this anymore. And if I tell anyone, or if I speak out against this, we'll lose our job. He'll, you know, we'll lose our income. My kids will lose their lives in terms of their life, how it is in this country. And I don't want that to happen. It would just be easier if I just died. Mm. And that was the story oh. I was hearing. I'm thinking, oh. we've got to have a different message for the church mm. and for women. And so I began to write about it and speak out about it. And, you know, it's been, um, I was grateful I was older because I was willing to risk my career. I thought I would lose my career after I wrote my last book. I thought I would be so banned from any kind of Christian <laughs> podcasts or ministry that uh, I would get blackballed. But I was, I was willing because I felt like God was really calling me to speak the truth. Mm, wow. I so get that because, yeah, in my book, which you were so very gracious to endorse, I just am so proud that your endorsement is on the back of my book, Beyond Messy Relationships. Uh, but that is part of our growth formula is breathing that fresh air, that mm -hmm. awareness, raising that level of awareness. Because when we when we start out, we we don't know. We don't know what covert emotional abuse is and uh, and then that intentionality and that risk. But uh, that's why I think I resonate with you, Leslie, is because you are speaking out. And I, I do like I, I didn't know if I'd have a counseling practice <laughs> I put myself out there. I right. thought most most counselors who write books are going to write about the messy and dramatic stories of their of their clients and not themselves. But I just had to put myself out there. Well, I think that was one of the things I really liked about your book, Judy, is that you were vulnerable enough to say um, this problem in my marriage and in my husband mm -hmm. is forcing me to look at what is my problem here. And, and I think that's a question we all have to ask ourselves in relationship with one another. What's my problem with their problem? Because what we want to do as women is we keep wanting to change the other person. Like if only they weren't that way, I wouldn't have that problem. But that's not in our power to do, nor is it our responsibility or is it our mandate by God. But people bring out the best and worst in us. And if there's a certain pe person, whether they're a toxic person, like my, for example, my mother, I grew up in an abusive home with my mother. She wasn't a, a, a male abuser, but she was a female abuser. She was an alcoholic. She was bipolar and she was mostly manic. So mm. in her mania, she would get very uh, mean and, and abusive and scary, sometimes not in her mania, but often when she was manic and she was also an alcoholic. And so her problem was that she was bipolar. She was an alcoholic. She was, you know, addicted. She was mean. Those were her problems. My problem was I didn't know how to be safe with my mother. I didn't know how to have a conversation with my mother. I didn't know whether, what my boundaries needed to be as an adult person with my mother. I could work on those things. And that was my work to do. 
I couldn't fix her problem. And I think so often in Christian relationships, we're spending a ton of energy trying to fix the other person's problem and not realizing that God is allowing this person in our lives for a reason. Um, I was at a professional seminar and you probably would appreciate this. And it was a business seminar. It wasn't Christians at all. We were marketing seminar and um, a woman asked me what I did. And I told her and she goes, oh, she goes, I married a narcissist. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'm like, tell me more. And she said, well, you know, I was a, a card carrying, passive, people pleasing, starry eyed little maiden who was looking for Prince Charming. And I married the devil instead. <laughs> and she said, and he taught me real fast how to get strong and grow up. Because had wow. I not, I would have just stayed small and immature and with my mm. Prince Charming and I would have stayed immature. And so it forced me to learn how to speak up and know what I needed and get help yes. and all. And so that was a good thing for her, even though it's a Absolutely. hard thing. You know what? That is such a true thing. If we could sit back or step back, and I'm wondering even in scripture where it says give thanks and everything and everything give thanks. If we were to have a bigger picture of how that, that abusive partner <laughs> raised our level of awareness to say, wait a minute, I am, I am a woman of dignity and value and worthiness. And yeah, so then we can give them thanks for raising our awareness and then grounding us in our truth. I think that's so true in, in all of life. Um, and I'm wondering if you could expound on that too. I mean, you, and, and talk too about the women that you're, that you helped, uh, Leslie and how, how they have that, that aha, those aha moments and how they get out of those messes, so to speak. Yeah. I think one of the things that, you know, especially for women, but I think even I've seen it with men as well, but we, we our culture is sort of in a victim mindset kind of mm -hmm. view of look what happened to me. This is this is why I am the way I am because of what happened to me. Um, poor me, this isn't fair. Life is too hard. I can't handle it. That kind of self-talk, that kind of thinking. And whether we had something bad happen to us, like being abused as a child or being in an abusive marriage or being raped or robbed or all of the tragedies in life, having, you know, a, being in a school shooting and participating mm -hmm. and, you know, having to figure out all that out. Um, I think there are legitimate victims. And I think as people, we need to love and care and support people who are truly victimized. But even a victim, when they are a true victim, like I was and, and other women that I work with, they're victim of abusers. Um, they have to ask themselves, what am I going to do with what's happening to me or what's mm -hmm. happened to me? Because if we don't ask ourselves that question, then we begin to become more victimized and more powerless because we feel helpless. So we've sort of had this victim mindset um, and we can't, we can't have any efficacy to change our situations. And so I think one of these things that God uses hardship, including evil people is to wake us up to, it's like putting your finger in the socket and saying, you know, I better yeah, not do that anymore. Yeah. And it's painful and we don't want to do it, but it's part of our, our maturing process to understand love you can love someone unconditionally. It doesn't mean you can have a good relationship with Jesus loved Judas. Jesus mm -hmm. loved Judas. Mm -hmm. And Judas mm -hmm. didn't change. Judas didn't repent. Judas didn't, you know, he betrayed Jesus. And so I mm -hmm. think we have this naive assumption as women that you know, if we love him enough or if we just, you know, do everything for him and do what God says and do what our church tells and submit and love and pray and try harder, that we're going to somehow get him to come to his senses. But what we're actually doing is we're feeding the monster of entitlement. Like I'm entitled to get away with sin and have no consequences. I'm entitled to treat you like an object and you shouldn't mm. complain. And I'm entitled to have sex with you, even though I treat you horribly. And, and that isn't good for him, let alone not good for you. And, you know, here's what I question a lot of times. I think in our, in our journey, in our faith journey, in our Christian journey, and I know a lot of folks who are listening to this that don't have a Christian background, but I want to really speak to all of us in our, our humanity, so to speak. But we've got to question what it is we're believing about um, that, that sets us up for, for devaluing life. I mean, is there and you know, our theology? Ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. And, and this, I'm just a sinner saved by grace mentality. Sometimes I cringe when we sing those songs simply because we are also beloved ch children of God. So if we look at another human being as this person is a, this, this interaction that I have with this person, it's a divine appointment and honoring them. And so I, I don't know. So I, 
maybe you can speak to that, how our theology may actually be setting us up, grooming us for the the power over mentality and and uh the less than mm-hmm. or accepting yeah. abuse period i think women have been groomed for that much more than men so certainly abuse happens to men as well verbal abuse if even physical abuse but the the power over dynamic is a little different because first of all I've interviewed a lot of men and most men wouldn't say they're physically afraid of their wife. They're not physically, spiritually afraid of their wife. She can't fling Bible verses at him. And he's like, oh my gosh, she's, she's my boss. She has to listen to me. Whereas in the Christian patriarchal uh, faith and not even in the patriarchal, that's all that strong. A woman still feels like, well, I, he's the boss. I have to submit, you know? And so he has more power over her in that way. And I think women are just wired to be more accommodating because we so want relationship and that's not a bad thing but when we're coupled like we're a giver and we're attracting takers because we don't have boundaries there's nothing wrong with being a giver I'm a giver but I also know how to say no and I also need know that a true relationship isn't going to happen unless there's a reciprocal relationship a mutual and reciprocal relationship so I can give to someone I can be generous I can have ministry to lots of different situations without an expe- expecting anything in return but I can't have a genuine relationship with someone if there's not a mutual give and take and I think that there's some misunderstandings about that the other thing that I think there's misunderstandings about is women I think that in the patriarchal culture the definition of woman is she's created for man that she's not created as an independent creature that God wants to grow and develop in her own right. She's there to take care of and help a man flourish instead of flourishing her own self. And so I think (laughs) we have come to disregard our own needs because they're not as important as his needs or our own goals because they're not as important as his goals or our kids' goals. And so we put ourselves last. And one of the things I say to a woman who says, you know, he doesn't love me. I said, you know, you might be right, but do you love you? Because if you don't love you, or if you don't believe you, like I had one woman who said, nobody believes me, you know, when she tells her pastor that she's being abused. And I said, well, do you believe you? Because if you Mm. believe you, that's enough, then you need to start taking some action. If this is really happening to you and you believe that, then then your self-given, God-given efficacy and and courage needs to come into play to protect yourself because that's what people do who are healthy. Wow. Wow, that is really a powerful message. I, I see it as women giving their power away. You really cannot like expect someone to do for you what really only you can do for yourself. And and when you do have that self-compassion and that self-love, I mean, we are to love others as we love ourselves, right? Um, That's seen as selfish in the, you know, especially for women. It's funny because my husband and I have had this discussion and I'll say, you know, (laughs) Like he'll, I'm cleaning the garage and he's sitting there watching the football game and I'll come and I'll say, don't you feel guilty? Like I'm out there cleaning the garage. (laughs) No, I don't feel guilty at all. Like if he were in the garage cleaning, I was sitting there doing something I wanted. I would feel guilty. I'd be like, oh, I should help him. And so it's a very different kind of mindset. I think that, um, that men and women have, and I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong, but I do think that it forces both of us. So it forces maybe men to learn to be less selfish or more giving more aware, wow, I'm not helping, I'm not contributing. And women to be more aware that, hey, I'm over-functioning. I'm, here's a good story. So I've got my Christmas decorations up and this is about it, this is my tree. But I used to go all out for Christmas because, you know, I didn't have a good Christmas. I don't remember one good childhood Christmas. And so I'm gonna create this Norman Walkwell Christmas. You know, we're gonna have the cookies (laughs) and we're gonna bake the cake for Jesus and we're gonna give our neighbors gifts and we're gonna do everything. And by the time Christmas rolled around, I was so cranky and so tired that I didn't enjoy a minute of it. I'm thinking, mm. something's wrong with this picture. Like nobody else <laughs> wanted all that stuff but me. And I'm like demanding everybody help me decorate the tree. And nobody wants to decorate the tree the way I want to decorate it. And it mm. just is crazy making. As we take a quick pause, here's two things you'll want to check out. First, you might want to know your next steps to improve your relationship. You can go to my website, judycounselor.com, and take the relationship stress quiz. Second, if you're looking to hire me as a speaker for your organization or to equip your employees with psychological wisdom for better communication, you can go to judyspeaker.com. I would love to support you. 
You've heard what my guests have to say. So it's time for you to take action. For now, back to our episode. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to go back to you and as a child living with uh, a traumatic childhood with a, a mom who had bipolar disorder and, and all of that. So a couple things. Um, as a child, I mean, every child you and it is a victim, basically. They are like, they are truly powerless. They are truly under the authority and power of their environment and their yeah. parents. So, uh, so I think it's very important just to really have grace for your childhood self, <laughs> like your child self. And I know that you would also agree with that. But can you speak, Leslie, to a person who does have a mental disorder, such as bipolar disorder. Um, I don't know what the situation was with your mom. Could, could she have treated that? And yeah, so, and I know you speak to this and, and I know that comes up with women that are married yeah. to a, a, a spouse or maybe she herself has bipolar disorder or some other kind of disorder. So speak to how mental illness plays into the relationship dynamics. Well, whether it's mental illness or physical illness or other things, it plays into the relationship. Mm -hmm. So if I marry someone who becomes blind or I marry someone who develops a frontal lobe brain tumor, it's going to affect our relationship. So mm -hmm. um, understand that you, we don't get a pass out of suffering in life. And even if you get married, bad things can happen and mm -hmm. you need to grow through them and, and deal with them as best you can. And, and they can be really beautiful, awful experiences. Um, but I think the differentiation that I make is if whatever this person's problem is, they're, you know, having, um, you know, mental illness and they're being abusive or they're being uh, overspending or whatever they're doing with their bipolar, or they have a brain tumor and they're running around with a knife, you know, because mm -hmm. they're delusional and it's mm -hmm. not their fault. They have a brain tumor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we're looking for is character issues. And I think that's the bottom line is that someone who's mentally ill and recognizes that they've harmed someone, whether they've harmed you financially or they've harmed you physically in their moment of delusion or they've harmed you um, um, emotionally by saying horrible things, um, a person who has good character will feel bad about that. They will feel bad about the harm they've caused um, and they will want you to have good boundaries and they will do what they need to do to protect you from them by going to the doctor, by getting mm -hmm. medication, by doing what they need to do because they are caring people. We make this assumption that, that all mentally ill people have bad character and that's not true. Mm -mm. That I, I have met, like I worked with a woman who was bipolar and she gambled on the internet with the stock market and lost all their like 401k, 401k plan. And I mean, her husband was really, really angry, um, but he, she was repentant. She was willing to have boundaries. She was willing to give up her credit cards or access to the accounts. She was willing to be in accountability with her psychiatrist. Anybody who noticed that she was getting a little hypomanic had the right to speak into her life and she would immediately make an appointment with her doctor. So here's a woman who's got mental illness and she did something pretty harmful to her family. And yet her character was repentant and remorseful. There's other people who say, I'm not going to the doctor and I'm not going to get help and you can't mm -hmm. tell me what to do. And that's not mental illness. That's got another name. It's called pride. It's called yeah. ego. We all have one. But when we do things that are stupid and we can't admit it and we can't own it and we can't see the harm we've caused, then it's impossible to bring healing to a broken relationship when you've broken trust. That is so very powerful and clear that there does need to be the, the that real clear distinction. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow, you, you do such so beautifully. I love how you use analogies to Leslie. I was listening to one of your webinars recently and um, yeah, and maybe you could just share that. The one that uh, recently about um, when you're in a mess or something, I, I don't know, it was really, really cool that you are responsible, right? You are responsible. When you're, when you're a child, you truly are a victim or when you have been victimized, but you, you have the ability, you have the ability to make some choices. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I love the analogies that you use. Yeah. And I think the quickest one, and this is not, the, I'll give two analogies that have to do with the body. So, so we become mature physically 
um, when we recognize our bodily functions. When we're an infant, we don't recognize them. We don't recognize when we have to go to the bathroom, we just go. We don't recognize that we're gonna fart, we just fart. You know, We just do those things as a little baby because mm -hmm. we don't have agency or control over those things. But part of our maturity is hopefully our parents say, <laughs> this is how we go to the bathroom and the toilet now. And we don't just go whenever we feel like it. we hold it until we go. And your body begins to learn how to do that. What parents don't teach their kids real well is that they have to teach them the same thing with their emotions. So we have yeah. to learn that when we're a baby, we just, wah, wah, wah. you know, we don't really mm -hmm. think about anybody else's feelings. We don't think about how we come across. We just express. But as we mature, we're told, hey, you can't act this way when you're angry. I don't care how tired you are. You can't hit mommy. So as a parent, we instruct our children both on naming their emotions and understanding what they are, but also self-regulation. And, and unfortunately, we haven't done a real good job and people are out of control emotionally a lot. And so this is the analogy I use with women who are telling me that they're, they can't help but react to their husband. So their husband is like, you know, vomiting on them and they vomit back or their husband is mm. lecturing them and then they're trying to be patient and then they explode. And I said, if you were sitting there and your husband was, you know, lecturing you or criticizing you, and you knew that your body was telling you that you're going to throw up any minute, no one in their right mind who's a mature person would allow that to happen to themselves. They would have enough self-respect and dignity that they would not just let their husband beat them up and just, bleh, just throw up all over themselves. They mm -hmm. would say, I can't hear this anymore. I'm not feeling well. I'm going to the bathroom. That's mm -hmm. what they would say. Any yeah. self-respecting mature person. And yet emotionally, we just let ourselves get poked and poked and poked and beaten up. Mm -hmm. and, and then we just can't take it anymore. And then we're starting to scream our own selves and out of control. And then we're labeled the abusive one or we're labeled the mentally ill one or we're labeled the one who's, you know, borderline personality because we can't handle ourselves. And they might do it in a cool as a cucumber kind of way to you know, intentionally to provoke us. And so one of the things I say to the women is that part of your job is to learn where your limits are, what you can do, what you can't do, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. And it's okay for you to have a voice. And I think in our Christian teaching, it's been taught that you, even the whole trial with the Dugar family and, you know, that whole teaching from the Bill Gothard Institute and all that mm -hmm. is that women really don't have a right to speak into their husband. They don't really have a right to confront sin or say this is not okay and so this goes back to us believing that we are in a relationship with someone not just to receive goodness from things but also to speak truth and love and to be able to do that wow that's that's really powerful and and when a woman gets to a point where she does um get out of that victim mentality it does change the dance. It changes that dynamic, doesn't it? In the, in the relationship. I mean, there's no way that it can't. <laughs> so almost like kind of teaching people how to treat you in a way. Is, is that kind of... That's yeah. exactly right. You mm -hmm. know, I, I think, so this is an, uh, another illustration I used to use when I was a counselor and I was teaching my clients this. We would be talking about it for a while and then I'd scoot up close to them and I'd start kicking them in the shins and you know, just gently with my foot. And they'd look at me like, what are you doing? And I would just keep kicking them. And I'd say, now, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> and they would say, stop it. Right. <laughs> and I'd say, good. That's a really good thing. When someone's kicking you in the shins, it's yeah, yeah. okay for you to say, stop oh. it. But, but then I would say, you know what? You're just being too sensitive. You're being ridiculous. Wow. I should be yeah. able to kick you if I want. In fact, you didn't pay your bill last month. And so I'm going to kick you as much as I want, because <laughs> I think that you're, you know, being ridiculous for complaining that you, you know, I can't kick. And so what do you do next? When someone refuses to respect your boundary and you say, mm. stop it. Yeah. yeah. And now yeah. what, what's your next step? And this is the part of getting your power back. Oh, I have choices. Like I could stand up and say to you, Hey, if you don't stop kicking me, I'm, I'm going to leave. Yeah. Yeah. You could do that. And, <laughs> and that changes the dance because once you don't allow me to do it anymore, then, then this is where the risk comes in because an aggressive abuser or even a covert abuser could mm -hmm. escalate in order to maintain control over you. And that's what feels the scariest, but that gives you as the wife information that this isn't really safe. I'm mm -hmm. not just imagining it. It's clear now, crystal clear. He doesn't respect my boundaries. He doesn't respect my person. What do I need to do from here to get safe? And that is an important question for any woman in that situation to make sure she takes care of her. Because if you're living in a toxic environment, I mean, imagine going into a house with toxic mold or, 
or secondhand smoke and you're getting asthma attack, wouldn't you take care of you? You wouldn't think that's selfish. You would say, I got to leave. I can't, I can't breathe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. That is so powerful, which really goes so beautifully into my, my acronym of breathing fresh air, because if you're breathing this toxicity day in and day out, and I've discovered too, that it's like, it's, you've been groomed for it, even in your own family of origin, like this is your normal type of thing. But, um, but that is what you just described is so very powerful and how, how to breathe, breathe fresh air, you know, that awareness and that intentionality and risk. But I'm going to actually ask you a question about that, because if there's one thing that you want to leave with, with listeners and, um, and you're speaking to, it may be just women and, and both men and women couples, um, and you want to give them hope, Leslie, and how, if they were, if they were to breathe fresh air, what would be the, the next one thing that you could tell them? You know, I think that awareness is crucial because we can't, be a, we can't change anything if we're not aware. And so just imagine if you didn't have any mirror in your house. And so mm -hmm. you were never really aware of how you looked. Mm -hmm. You just kind of got up in the morning and went about your day. Well, that's how people psychologically, emotionally, and relationally, you know, kind of do. They don't stop and say, wow, why did I just say what I said? Or wow, you know, I'm, I'm really crabby right now. I wonder what that's about. We're not asking ourselves those self-awareness questions in the Bible. For example, the psalmist says, huh, why are you downcast, oh, my soul? You know, he's mm -hmm. aware that he was depressed and he was mm -hmm. asking himself important questions. So I think that awareness is the very first step. But even if you have a mirror, you're not aware of everything. Like you can't see the back of your head. And so there's other people in your life that you trust that have your back that say, hey, you know, you've got lipstick on your teeth before you're going to a Zoom meeting or, um, you know, I remember heading out of the bathroom one time when I was in a speaking engagement. This was when we used to wear nylons and my skirt was tucked into my pantyhose and I didn't see <laughs> the back of my <laughs> body. <laughs> and as I was leaving the door, a faithful sister who I had, had no idea, she was a stranger, but she said, oh, dear, I don't think you want to leave this way. <laughs> so, so Hebrews tells us we need faithful truth tellers in our life. And so I think marriage is that opportunity. If I say to my husband, your zipper's down, he's not mad at me. He's grateful because I have his back, <laughs> right? If he tells me, here's a, here's a breath mint before you go in the you know signing line for your book, um, yeah, he's yeah. not trying to humiliate me. He's trying to have my back. And yet when we tell each other, hey, you are harsh with the kids tonight or what's going mm -hmm. on? Or we, mm -hmm. we say, hey, I don't really like the way you're spending money and not, not talking to me about that. That's not working for me. All of a mm -hmm. sudden, our egos get all offended and we get defensive and we're not willing to allow this person in our life who's the very closest person to us mm -hmm. to be our truth teller and and if we don't have truth tellers in our lives like mirrors like you know uh, lights that we can see what's going on yeah then we can't make those adjustments and so i think if a, if a couple could be intentional so not only aware but intentional about receiving feedback from people who who you know or you assume love you and they're giving you feedback saying ouch that hurt yeah. then you don't say well you're just being too sensitive you might need to say wow i i didn't know that that would hurt but i can see you're hurt so i'm going to believe you and how do i not do this again instead of minimizing mm. it or deflecting it or saying you're too sensitive or blaming you for well you made me do it because you didn't do what i wanted um and so i think that awareness and that intentionality of saying this person's in my life to help me grow into a better stronger person and if i dismiss or discount everything they have to say then i won't be able to have that opportunity and the risk is is that our ego is wounded and so mm. we have to differentiate between hurt and harm all right uh -huh. so love does no harm mm -hmm. so our intention is not to harm someone so if we're calling someone names or we're beating them up or we're you know uh, being cruel to people. That's not speaking the truth in love, mm -hmm. but speaking the truth in love. If someone says to me, Hey, you know, you had a mistake with grammar on your blog. They're not trying to harm me. They're trying to help me be a better writer. It, it hurts my ego, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. Right. And so that's where yeah. we have to differentiate that. I think, and, and your analogy of a mirror, I just, I think too, of some relationships, like your spouse may be this distorted mirror, like when you go to a, mm -hmm. an amusement park and, yeah. and things are all distorted. So it's so very important. 
I believe one which I think is awesome that you provide, Leslie, is is some flat mirrors for people, <laughs> and that is what Scripture does. It's uh, it's being able to see truth, but but seeing a, a, a reflective image of yourself that is more yeah. truthful, and and um, because you are a person of dignity, and you want your relationship to be one that is respectful, but has good will toward each other, mm -hmm. and willing to learn and grow. I mean. I think this is just the human journey, isn't it? I mean, we're we're not going to be perfect people. I love it how you and your, you said you and your husband have been married forty six years. You've had your anniversary, neither one of you like you grew through that. I would imagine like you've got different stages in your marriage, and mm -hmm. you probably have whatever version of yourself now at this stage. Um, We've yeah. both grown into better people, but I've never. So here are the two criteria: I've never felt afraid of my husband, mm. and I've never felt like I couldn't trust him. Right. Wow. So I think those in 46 years. So we've had our arguments, we've had our times of disappointment in each other and all yeah. those kind of things. But I've never felt afraid of him or that I couldn't trust him. And I would wow. think he would say the same to me. So I think those two criteria are somewhat deal breakers in any healthy relationship that you mm. can't have a healthy relationship when you feel afraid of someone, whether it's your parent, whether it's your boss, whether it's your pastor, whether it's your husband or your friend. If you're afraid to say no, if you're afraid to disagree, if you're afraid to you know, speak your own mind, there's something toxically wrong with that relationship or with mm. you. Either you're such a people pleaser and you're bowing into the fear of man, or there's something really wrong with the relationship. And it's up to you to become aware of which it is. And I also loved how you said that just because someone says something about you doesn't make it true. So people can, my mother told me, you know, I wish I never had you. You have flat eyes. You, you know, have no sparkle to your life. Mm. She said horrible things to me. Mm. Um, so mm. That's not who I am. God says who I am. And so the truest place to get your self-respect and who you are is looking at what God says about you. Um, but also trusted friends who you know have your back mm -hmm, mm -hmm. can help you, especially when you say, hey, my husband says I'm bipolar. And you go to a counselor and they evaluate you and say, you're not bipolar. Mm -hmm. You're emotional and you need to learn yeah. to regulate your emotions better, but you're not bipolar. These aren't, these are the signs of bipolar. These are not the signs of bipolar. So I think being able to get some feedback from other trusted, either professionals or other girlfriends, you know, my husband says, you know, he wants to do a threesome and that's normal. And we should be able to do that. I'm just approved because mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. You might say to your mm -hmm. girlfriend, does your husband think this? Does your husband mm -hmm. ask you to do this? this? Mm -hmm. You know, and so to be able to get some feedback that no, this isn't healthy and you're allowed to say no, it's okay to say, I don't want to do that. And I think going on um, the R of the acronym of breathing air, a risk for some folks that, that may be listening to us right now might be to disclose to your best friend what's really going on in your marriage, yeah. because mm -hmm. there is so much isolation. That's what I have discovered. And um, I love it, Leslie, that you provide space for women to de-isolate, which is so, so huge. So I want to thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. You're um, so welcome. It's so um, hard in the church to be honest, isn't it? And so to oh have those God. private groups is really helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. So why don't, would you please just tell listeners how they can get in touch with you? Yeah. So my main ministry is to Christian women in destructive or abusive relationships, but also just how to build healthy relationships, both with other women, as well as with uh, a partner. Um, and they can find me at my website, lesliebernick.com. Yes. And uh, thank you so much, Leslie. It's just been a delight to, to talk with you, what value you provide. And um, just want to thank you for making a, a dent in this world. <laughs> and for all well, of you're us. so welcome. So uh, thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Wow. Something Leslie said really touched me when she asked, do you believe you? Do you love you? Your self trust and self compassion are of utmost importance. You are so worthy of your vibrant and beautiful life. Don't hesitate to reach out for help. I want to invite you to join us next week where I'll sit down with Chad and Shelley Prevost. They give us insights about the perennial wisdom of the Enneagram. You don't want to miss it. In the meantime, don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe on the streaming platform of your choice. See you next week.